I, I think guys, we are ready to start. Uh, so we, I don't want everybody to wait. It's exactly <clears> now. <throat> uh, it, this is uh, mission and time and good day, everybody. It's nice to uh, see you over Zoom uh, again in this uh, Monday. And today we have uh, two speakers. Uh, each of the speakers will be talking about half an hour and there will be about uh, 10 to 15 minutes of uh, Q&A after each talk. And after the second Q&A, uh, we will be um, letting people who want to discuss and talk uh, with uh, speakers uh, to become a panelist so they can personally ask their questions. And uh, today we have two speakers. Uh, the first one will be uh, Professor Rahim, Rahim Opur. And uh, the second one is uh, Professor Alexander Bull. And the first speaker will be introduced by Ifa, Dr. Ifad Miller. And um, nice seeing you all again. And I am passing it to you, Ifad. Okay, so... Uh... Good evening, good morning, good day for everyone in the world. Uh, so the first picture is uh, Professor Shai Rahimipo. Uh, in 2001, he finished his PhD uh, in organic uh, chemistry and neurobiology at the Weizmann Institute of Science uh, with Professor uh, Mati uh, Friedkin and Professor Isaac Koch. Uh, then he continued at the Weizmann Institute for his first postdoctoral research uh, in chemistry and photobiology uh, with Professor Yehuda Mazur. Uh, and he uh, moved for a postdoctorate uh, uh, in 2003 uh, at the Scripps uh, Research Institute under supervision of uh, Professor uh, Reza Gadiri. There he started working on self-assemble of cyclic peptide and cyclic glycopeptides. And uh, in fact, uh, since uh, uh, 2006, he is a faculty member at uh, the Department of Chemistry and at Bar-Ilan Bar University. Uh, so he uh, received uh, many uh, fellowships and, and uh, prestige uh, awards. Uh, his first uh, prestige uh, uh, fellowship was the Fulbright Postdoctoral uh, Fellowship and the Human Frontiers uh, Long-Term Fellowship uh, as a postdoctoral uh, uh, researcher. Um, and since 2008, he awarded se several uh, 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 awards on the cyclic peptides, among them uh, the uh, Elias Award, and a Christian for Israel Chair in Medical uh, Research. And uh, his uh, research interest uh, is uh, very broad, but specifically and related to what he will speak today, uh, the group of uh, Professor Wahimipur developed super molecular uh, based platform that can be used as general scaffold for discovery of novel anti-amyloidogenic compounds with potential uh, applications in the early diagnosis and treatment of various amyloidogenic uh, diseases. So um, with this, um, Shai, the floor is yours. Thanks. Hello to everybody. First of all, uh, many thanks to Ifat for his her kind introduction. Uh, I would like also to thank Rams for arranging this uh, wonderful uh, Zoom in hours. But I really hope that we can be able to see each other very soon to discuss our science and also our results. So till then that it's happening, uh, what I want to do in this 30 minutes or so is sharing with you some of our recent non-published uh, results dealing with the development of a new uh, approaches for early diagnosis and therapy of Alzheimer's disease. So basically one of our major goals in the is uh, to design and develop new chemical probes that can use to diagnose AD and other related diseases in very early stage of the disease, even before appearance of the symptoms. Uh, the idea is uh, actually very similar to the tests that are performed routinely today to detect high levels of different uh, biomarkers, such as, uh, for example, cholesterol or uh, sugar, 
that they are a main risk factor for development of vascular diseases and uh, diabetes. The second aim of our studies is uh, to utilize this information that are accumulated from these diagnostic studies to develop new treatment for uh, Alzheimer's disease and other major amyloidogenic diseases such as Parkinson's disease, type 2 diabetes, and Huntington's disease. So a few words about uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that everybody knows about that, but I will give uh, some introduction for those that are not familiar with that. So AD is a neurodegenerative disease that affects memory and cognition. This is all we know. It is a progressive and uh, irreversible disease that mainly affects neurons and is the most common uh, cause of uh, dementia affecting, uh, affecting today about 12 million people. Yearly, unfortunately, the number of uh, this uh, illness is expected to triple itself by 2050, which of course will cause enormous emotional and financial burden to the society. <clears throat> the major risk factor of uh, age is, of course, this age. And it means that the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease increased dramatically with the age, reaching to about 50% of people that are over 85 years old. Uh, pathog pathologically, AD is uh, characterized by uh, severe atrophy and shrinkage of the brain, which is uh, associated with the neuronal loss. This is also accompanied by decrease with the, uh, with the levels of several uh, neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. And therefore, uh, one of the current way of treating symptoms of uh, Alzheimer's disease is to giving patient acetylcholine esters inhibitors in order to increase the level of acetylcholine esters. Uh, acetylcholine esters yes. So perhaps the most notable pathology of AD is associated with the extracellular deposition of a senile plaques that are made from a beta uh, protein, which we'll discuss it later. In the later, uh, later stage of the disease, in addition to these plaques, there is also accumulation of intracellular neurofibrillary tangles that are, are composed of highly phosphorylated tau. So in few words, the beta is re relatively a very short the polypeptide ranging from 40 to 33 amino acid. It is produced by proteolytic degradation of larger protein, namely amyloid precursor protein by two uh, enzymes, namely beta and gamma secretase. Uh, both a beta 40 and especially a beta 42, 42 are highly amyloidogenic. It means that at the relatively low concentration, they tend to self-assemble it to, to soluble aggregates and fibers that you show here. And these uh, fibers are usually rich in cross beta sheet structures. So it was a consensus for many years that the insoluble form of a beta fibrils and protofibrils are responsible for the neuron toxicity leading to the Alzheimer's disease. And therefore, many attempts has, uh, have been made to target this uh, fibrillar form of beta, as uh, you know, with a very limited success. It become, however, clear in recent years that uh, neither the monomeric form of beta nor the fibrin form of beta is, uh, are especially toxic. But this is a rather the metastable intermediates, uh, which we call them as soluble aggregates that they are highly toxic to the neurons. Uh, indeed, by targeting these uh, soluble oligomers, uh, uh, the antibody aducanumab and also BAN241, uh, 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 oh, that is in the clinical trials, have shown that they can uh, delay the memory decline in AD patients and also Aducanumab got uh, FDA approved in recent years. Uh, what is most important about this research in clinical trials is that this is studies co uh, collectively suggest that <clears throat> EBITDA aggregation actually starts most likely 20 to 30 years before the appearance of the first the symptoms, allowing a long period of time for intervention. So as you can know, as you can see, See, as you know, misfolding of, uh, misfolding of the protein and their aggregation to the toxic oligomer is not only unique to amyloid beta and Alzheimer's disease, 
there are more than 35 different devastating diseases we know today that they are caused by misfolding and aggregation of related proteins among this uh, devastating disease. You can find, of course, the Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, type two diabetes, Huntington, ALS, and other. Uh, I think what is very interesting about this protein is that the, all, the, yeah, all of these amyloidogenic proteins are generated from very different proteins with minimal similarity in their sequence and in the lengths they rather self-assemble to generate a very common three-dimensional cross beta sheet structure that may suggest about their similar mechanism of toxicity. The structure of these amyloids are so similar to each other that single antibody that has been generated by Charles Glade to target the uh, oligomeric form of a beta can also recognize all other amyloids uh, oligomers. Moreover, it has been shown by many studies that not only the structure of these amyloids are very similar to each other, the mechanism by which they cause toxicity is also very similar. For example, it has been shown by many studies that these amyloids can interact with the cell membrane to generate pores and, other, and channels that are very similar to those generated by antimicrobial peptides. So these structural and functional similarities between the amyloid are most likely also responsible for the cross interaction and cross seeding. For example, you can see here a few publications out of many that describe cross interaction and cross seeding between different amyloids. Uh, for example, it has been shown that uh, amylin, which is responsible for type two diabetes can cross interact with amyloid beta and modulating the aggregation and toxicity. This may also explain how, uh, why high, uh, people with high incidence of Alzheimer's disease, they have more chance to get uh, diabetes or vice versa. Astonishingly enough uh, to our story, we recently found that the biochemical and biophysical properties of these amyloids, pathogenic amyloids, uh, closely resemble the self-assembled cyclic peptide nanotubes that we are studying in, um, in my lab. Uh, this nanostructure that you've shown here are generated from self-assembly of a simple cyclic peptides that are generated very uniquely from even number of alternating D and L amino acid uh, under condition that favor hydrogen bonding, such as membrane, uh, this cyclic pattern can stack in the top of each other to generate a cross beta sheet structure. This is the intrinsic form of these cyclic peptides that, that they are very similar to that of uh, the amyloids. Uh, it has been shown by many studies that uh, similar to the pathogenic uh, amyloids, this uh, self assembled cyclic peptides can also interact with different membranes and generate holes and uh, channels that is uh, largely res responsible for their potent antibacterial and antiviral activity. Uh, interest interestingly enough, uh, we have recently shown that uh, many of these cyclic peptides, irrespectively of their sequence, can be also recognized by A11 antibody, which was originally developed, as I told, to recognize a beta oligomer, suggesting that these cyclic peptides have very similar structures to that of uh, toxic oligomers. So based on this finding, we have generated a libraries of 8,000 cyclic peptide hexamers that uh, we synthesized them by one bit, one compound approach for over a weekend. And uh, we screened uh, about 500 of these beads for uh, peptides that can inhibit the aggregation of amyloid beta using the, you know, the classical uh, fluorescent uh, thiophilavin T experiment. So after finding the hits from this uh, medium uh, uh, through to the screening, we, we could determine the sequence of this peptide by tandem mass spectroscopy, synthesize them in larger amount and study their biological and biochemical uh, properties. Here I'm showing you the activity of two cyclic peptides, CP1 and CP2, that were discovered from a screening of about uh, 500 beads 
Uh, as you can see here, the, these peptides are relatively very potent in, in uh, inhibiting the aggregation of a beta, very similar to that of KLVFF peptide that is uh, usually used as a, a standard for the peptides that uh, show anti-amylogenic activity. The anti-amylogenic of these peptides were also confirmed by electron microscopy, which uh, clearly showed that the peptides prevent the formation of these nice fibers. Uh, we have also tested the effect of uh, these peptides in inhibiting the toxicity of uh, amyloid beta um, uh, oligomers by using the neuron like PC12 cells. So while the overnight incubation of the aggregated A beta with these cells reduced the survival to about 60-70%, we found that co-incubation of the amyloids with the A beta with, this, uh, with our circuit peptide significantly decreased the toxicity, suggesting that uh, this, this peptide is indeed doing something. So we have also carried out some biophysical studies to, to probe the mechanism of action of these circuit peptides. So in our THT-based uh, kinetic assay, we showed that the, the circuit peptide CP2 can dramatically increase the lag phase, even in the presence of large amount of a beta C, suggesting that it can probably interact with the early form of a beta species, or alternatively, alternatively, it can interact with the A-beta seed and convert them to incompetent uh, structures. We have also used the ELISA in our studies using two special oligomer-specific antibodies known as A11 and OMAB. And we showed that uh, as expected, the amount of this oligomer is, go is going up by the time. However, our cyclic peptide can very nicely, can dramatically decrease the, con the concentration of these uh, amyloids, uh, toxic oligomers, uh, which is further confirming our THD results. So we have also used the uh, pickup cross-linking methods to understand the uh, effect of our cyclic peptide in oligomeric distribution of a beta, which are metastable in their nature. As uh, you can see here, the freshly prepared a beta tend to spontaneously generate low molecular weight oligomers, such as a dimer, trimer, tetramer, and so on. Upon aging of this solution, we see that there is a, a gradual decrease in the amount of these low molecular weight uh, oligomers in the favor of higher molecular uh, weight uh, uh, oligomers that we, we are they are to be toxic. Uh, we found very interestingly that introduction of uh, CP2 to this equilibrium changed very nicely the equilibrium and it's stabilized somehow the monomeric, dimeric, and the trimeric form of the a beta, so it means that we, we, uh, these peptides can inhibit the formation of toxic oligomers by binding and stabilizing this uh, A beta species. So by stabilizing the monomeric, dimeric, and trimeric form of A beta that they are soluble in their nature, one can expect, expect that according to the Chatelier principle, CP2 can also maybe can solubilize the preformed fibril by shifting the equilibrium toward this soluble species. So indeed, we have shown that uh, incubation of uh, mature a beta fibrils with uh, increasing concentration of cyclic peptide can dose dependently uh, disassemble uh, the cyclic the a beta and the uh, fluorescent of THD was decreased. These results were also confirmed by electron microscopy, which, uh, which again showed that the beta fibers are deformed in the presence of CP2. Uh, importantly, by using the beta, uh, uh, by using A11 antibody and uh, in our uh, uh, dot blood experiment, we, uh, we proved that this assembly of this uh, mature fibril do not generate a new pool of A beta monomers or oligomers that can be toxic. So collectively, in this result, they suggest that CP2 can inhibit the aggregation of A-beta 
And also disassemble preform aggregates and fit wheels to non toxic species by off pathway mechanism. So I want to tell you back to this um, uh, pickup experiment that we demonstrated that CP2 binds selectively to early uh, beta oligomers, uh, such as uh, monomer, dimer, and, tri uh, tri uh, uh, and uh, trimers. So we uh, ask ourselves whether these peptides can also use as a probe to bind these early uh, aggregates in early, for uh, early diagnosis of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So indeed in our ex vivo experiment, using brain, brain uh, slices derived from six months transgenic FAD mice that overexpress human E beta and E beta plugs, we were able to show that CP2 can stain the diffused form of E beta species much better than congruent that can stain on the beta fibrils. So these results uh, actually encourage us to further study the CP2 as a potential pro probe for early diagnosis of a beta uh, of a Alzheimer's disease in vivo. So in order to test the feasibility of our cyclic peptide in early detection of amyloid species, even before appearance of the symptoms, they perform PET CT imaging studies on very young FAD mice starting at age of 44 days. This is before they generate plaques using the radioactive derivatives of, of our cyclic peptides. To do so, our cyclic peptide CP2 was first conjugated to the NOTA that bind metals such as uh, copper, radioactive copper with high affinity and specificity. Then the radioactive uh, copper was injected uh, to intravenously to the very young uh, transgenic animal. And 20 hours later, the animal were imaged by PET CT. We chose the FAD model for our studies for several reasons. Uh, first, it is the most severe mice model for AD that overexpress a human a beta, a human APP with five mutations that leads to fast accumulation of a beta plugs and of course the symptoms. Uh, we know that these animals develop the first intranumeral oligomers at early age as uh, one, one and a half months. And only after half a month or one month, they start to generate extracellular beta plugs, which then is developed farther and farther to cause initial memory defects that which can be detected at age of four to five months. Therefore, by using this method, we could easily follow up the disease pathology and also to follow the progression of the disease by PET CT. So here you can see the PET CT images of some FAD mice after single injection of radioactive septic peptides. These results clearly demonstrate that there is an age dependent increase in the accumulation of the radioactive cyclic peptide, which was detected first at age of 44 days in the thalamus of, uh, of these animals. And then uh, very interestingly, they spread to the other region of the uh, brain at 72 days uh, of the animal to the hippocampus, cortex, and here the brainstem. Uh, inter uh, very interestingly, we found that there is no accumulation of these cyclic peptides in the cortex and the hippocampus, for example, of uh, 44 days animals. And this is the, against all the data that is uh, known today. While at age six months that the, the animals are already have some sim symptoms, the peptide can be mainly uh, be found in, in the thalamus, hippocampus, and the cortex as it is published and is reported. So in control experiment, we found that even if, uh, animals that they are in 95 days, that they are older than what we have, the uptake of a Pittsburgh compound B, which is known as a PIB, which is frequently used as a probe for diagnostic of AD, was found to be localized only in the cortex, hippocampus, 
with very, very lower contracts. You can see that it's a very faded. Uh, it should be noted that uh, we know that uh, the PIP compound is uh, selectively bind to the fibrillase and not to the oligomers. So the higher uptake of our cyclic peptides in the brain of young animals uh, relatively to the PIP can uh, colorate, as we see in the next slide, with the high levels of a beta or oligomers that they don't bind PIP. So indeed, in order to show that the intense PET that we saw in our PET CT study is in the thalamus especially, is correlated with the beta oligomers, the brain of the treated animals were sectioned and stained with anti-amyloid beta antibody CE10 that recognize all form of a beta. And then the same animals were also tested uh, with uh, the antibody A11, which specifically can bind only to the oligomeric form of a beta. So in, uh, in agreement with uh, other studies, we can see that the cortex, subiculum, hippocampus, thalamus, and brain stem of uh, these animals are stained with 6EA10 confirming the previous studies that uh, these animals overexpress uh, uh, amyloid beta in these tissues. In sharp uh, uh, contrast, uh, when we test and we image the animals with uh, A11 antibody, we recognize that the, the highest amount of a beta oligomers are uh, concentrated in the thalamus, uh, followed by amygdala, cortex, and uh, of course, the hippocampus. The high accumulation of a beta oligomers in the thalamus that you show here, uh, that you see here, for, sorry, uh, it's uh, correlated very well with the strong PET signal that we saw in the, our PET uh, studies, indicating that PET CT that we are looking at at 44 days are actually originated from a beta oligomers rather than monomeric form or fibular form of a beta. So to confirm further that uh, our radioactive cyclic peptides detect a beta oligomers rather than soluble uh, or fibrillar a beta, the A11 stain slices that you show here were also studies by confocal microscopy. These studies uh, demonstrated that if the fluorescent signal generated from A11 antibody are appeared mainly as intracellular punctate structures that you can see here inside the cells, which is consistent with the studies showing that the interneuronal beta oligomers are formed in early stage of the disease, and then they further aggregate intercellularly to generate the plugs outside the cells. Okay, so next uh, we have, uh, uh, I think we don't have time for that. Uh, how much time I have, in fact? Five minutes. Five minutes? No, three minutes. Okay, so I will skip here. We test also the efficacy of these animals in C elegans that they have overexpression of a beta. In our cases, we showed that we can rescue the animals from the damaging effect of a beta oligomers, especially the oligomers. We showed that this CPT, the CP2 can reduce selectively the amount of a, a beta oligomers. And also we showed that they can also reduce the number of the plugs in, in, in this uh, model. We then uh, uh, started to use uh, transgenic uh, animals, uh, mice for these studies to show the effect of our cyclic peptides in, uh, in the real animals. So in, in this experiment, we took 45 days old FAD mice and injected, that, injected them intraperitoneally with lead cyclic peptides three times per week for total period of 16 weeks. So this is a chronic administration of the cyclic peptides. Then the animals were tested for their memory, cognition, while the effect of treatment in total amount of a beta was uh, evaluated post-mortem three to four weeks after by performing in view imaging and immunohistochemical studies. Uh, 
So making a, a long, to, uh, long story short in a Barnes maze uh, by behavioral test, uh, where the mice have to learn and remember the position of the red hole here in, the, in, in our maze, uh, to escape from the maze, the 80 mice uh, usually need uh, significantly more time to find this hole as compared to the normal mice. For example, uh, while uh, wild type of mice find the red, uh, this red hole within 23 seconds, the FDA mice need much more time, about 40 seconds. And we showed that chronic administration of a CPT to this cyclic pet, uh, to this animal, uh, dramatically reduced the time required for this animal to find the correct hole. And they find the hole very similar to that of a normal animal. Uh, we also shown that uh, at given time, the, the, the FAD mice enter the correct, uh, correct hole fewer times than wild type mice. This is because they have a difficulties in their memory uh, to find the correct hole. For example, uh, while uh, white, uh, white type of mice enter the correct hole seven times per, per, per our experiment, the FAD mice entered the hole only three times, which uh, uh, then we found that uh, FAD mice that uh, were treated with this cyclic peptide uh, entered the correct hole very similar to that of white time, suggesting that treatment with the cyclic peptide uh, prevents the loss of uh, memory and, le and learning capability of, of, of the mice. Uh, we get very similar uh, uh, um, results with uh, two other uh, behavioral uh, experiments, namely novel object recognition and why maze experiment. I don't have time to do go through that. But what I want to show you now is that uh, following the behavior test, we also uh, image the brain of these animals. And for that, we use uh, fluorescent imaging, uh, meaning that uh, we, uh, we intravenously uh, treat the animals with the uh, uh, fluorescent CP2. We wait 24 hours, perfuse the animals, and uh, check the fluorescent uh, signal of this animal. So as you can see here, the fluorescent signal of a uh, brain of FD, FAD animals are significantly more intense than those of a wild type, which is very in good agreement with our PET CT studies. However, treatment of these animals with CP2, one can see that the fluorescent signal is dramatically decreased to the level of wild type animals. Uh, which further also confirm our uh, results in C. elegans models. Uh, to confirm again the imaging results that we get before, we also examine the animal immunohistochemically using uh, the C10 animals. So as you can see here, the control FAD animals that in the end of the treatment has an already six months age, uh, they accumulate very large amount of a beta, especially in the brain, especially in the hippocampus, in the cortex, thalamus, and also in the amygdala. As uh, you can hopefully see here, the amount of a beta uh, plus consider, uh, considerably reduced in FDA animals that were chronically treated with CP2, you see here much less uh, uh, aggregates here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so notably, uh, notably significant reduction in amount of a beta plugs were detected uh, in a C, uh, CA1, in Dante gyrus, and in the cortex that all of them are responsible for cognition and uh, learning capabilities. So in the conclusion, uh, I hope that I succeeded to, to convince you that a self assembled uh, cyclic DL alpha peptide can effectively cross interact with a beta due to their biochemical and structural similarities. We showed that these cyclic peptides can bind and stabilize monomeric, dimeric, trimeric form of a beta and disassemble preformed a beta oligomers and fibrils by off pathway mechanism. In our imaging studies using PET, we have shown that this cyclic peptide can cross the BBB and 
bind a beta oligomers in very young asymptomatic FAD mice, even before the appearance of any symptoms. Uh, finally, we, that we demonstrated that early treatment of uh, transgenic mice with our cyclopeptide can dramatically delay the onset of the disease and related symptoms by inhibiting the aggregation and, uh, and accumulation of beta species in the brain. Of course, we are looking forward for potential uh, collaborators to study the efficacy of this uh, cyclopeptide in other uh, relevant animal uh, models and understanding the mode of action of these peptides in more detail. Uh, he, finally, I would like to thank uh, the students that performed these experiments, uh, especially to Maram Habashi, Sudipto, and Kultip. Uh, a special thanks for funding agency that uh, uh, kindly fund us through these years. Uh, a special thanks also to our collaborator, to Astrid Graslund for their NMR studies and Brigitte Gurin for the PET. And finally, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sai. Um, I will start to read the questions. Um, the first question is from Rams. Uh, thanks for excellent talk, Shai. Uh, so he has several questions. So we'll go one by one. Are the cyclic peptides selective to A beta only? If yes, why should they be selective? Or do they also inhibit other amyloid proteins or IDPs? Okay, so this is an excellent question. Uh, so as I mentioned in the beginning, all of these amyloids have a very similar 3D uh, uh, structure of a cross beta sheet. So this is not, a, let's say, surprise to, uh, to, no, uh, to, to notice that our cyclopeptide can also uh, bind other kinds of amyloids. They, they, have, they may have some nuance in their sequence, but we show that the same peptide that bind to a beta, for example, can also bind to alpha C nuclein and reduce the amount of alpha C nuclein inside the neuronal cells. Okay, thank you. And the second question, it took likes 10 times higher concentration of CP2 is required to inhibit a beta aggregation effectively, right? Do you have any data for the binding affinity of CPT2 to a beta under different conditions in buffer, model membrane, cell, etc.? Okay, so uh, this is also a very nice question. The, the data that I show here with CP2 this is the first generation of our cyclic peptides. Now we have a cyclic peptides, uh, the, the, the derivatives of CP2, that there are active in sub stoichiometrical uh, ratio between a beta and uh, um, cyclic peptides. Uh, <clears throat> and we also notice that if we're changing the, the buffer, in vitro, we can get a better activity. For example, uh, in our hand, when we're working with the trees buffer, uh, this ratio is dramatically changed. So yes, we have peptides that are much more active than CP2 now. And the last question of Franz, does CPT2's um, ability to form membrane pores play any role on A beta toxicity? So we showed that actually in alpha C nuclein method, which we use the artificial membranes. So we showed that, for example, while CP2 itself at very high concentration can somehow perturb the membrane, together with alpha C nuclein, they uniquely some kind of buffering the activity of each other. So when we use them, alone, the CP2, you can see it at high concentration, it can have some effect in the membrane, but when you put, it, put them together, you can see that this effect is completely uh, gone. Mm, nice. And the next one is the, a question from Astrid. A very interesting lecture. How important is alternating L and D? How important is cyclic shape? Okay, so I didn't have time to, to, to go through that. We have uh, uh, performed systematic studies to know the uh, structure activity relationship of this cyclic peptide. For we show 
very clearly that uh, the alternative D and L is, is enormously important and also the cyclic nature, but the cyclic nature is somehow less uh, affecting the, the activity. The alternative D and L is most, uh, uh, let's say, most important for the activity. Okay, thanks you. And there's a questions for anonymous attendee. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Do you have any idea why the effective cyclic peptides should include both D and L stereoid isomers? What role does the amino acid stereometrically uh, have? Okay, so uh, if we coming back to the structure of this cyclic peptide as shown here, so you can see that only with having D and L alternatively with the even number of cyclic peptide, this cyclic peptide can have the planar shape. Once they have planar shape, they have a C2 symmetry that now they can stack in the top of each other to generate a so-called cross beta sheet structure. So th this is very important to have this alternative D and L uh, conformation. Otherwise, they will not stack in the top of each other. Yeah, and, and I have a question, and I guess it's the last one because no questions uh, so far. And um, did you try the, to look uh, whether a zinc copper that we know um, promotes uh, in some concentrations amyloid beta aggregation or alpha-synuclein aggregation? So do, do you think that uh, the cyclic peptide uh, will also be good uh, inhibitor for this aggregation? Okay. So the, this is the, another avenue of our research that we are carrying out. CP2 by itself cannot bind metals. So we show that it, 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 it's not. But once we change in one sequence in this cyclic peptide, for example, by changing the serine in position two with the histidine, we show that we can generate a multifunctional cyclic peptide that can also compete with a beta for, uh, for copper uh, uh, binding affinity. And we showed that it can very nicely also reduce the toxicity of copper with, with the beta in the presence of, uh, let's say, peptide that have two histidine on that. Okay, thank you. Interesting, very interesting. So thank you, Shai. And I guess now we'll um, go to the next speaker, Magda. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's it's my turn. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alexander Bull, uh, who is a professor of uh, protein biophysics at the Technical University of uh, Denmark, DTU. He received his PhD in the University of Cambridge, where he worked with doctors Mark uh, Welland, Chris Dobson, Thomas Knowles, and later stayed as a research fellow at Madeleine uh, College. In uh, 2015, Dr. Bull became an assistant professor at the University of Dusseldorf. And in 2019, he joined DTU. Uh, Dr. Bull is a recipient of uh, many awards, among which are 2016 Young Investigator Award of the German Society for Biophysics and Biochemical um, uh, for biophysics and the Biochemical Society uh, 2017 Early Career Research uh, Award for Biotechnology. Uh, his current research uh, focus is in the physical chemistry of biomolecular self-assembly. And I'm not gonna steal more of your time. It's uh, my pleasure to meet you and um, you can uh, start your presentation. Uh, yes, I'm hoping that it works now. Can you see my presentation? Yes, yeah, you, you just need to go into presenters. Yes. Uh, yeah. But it's perfect. Okay. Perfect. It's nice. <clears throat> yeah. uh, all right, then I'll try and get some uh, pointer as well. Yes. Uh, all right. Um, yeah. Thank you very much to those of you who, who are sticking on and uh, listening to the second talk. And of course, also thank you very much to Rams for putting together such an uh, amazing uh, seminar series. And it's an honor to be uh, part of that. So I would like to tell you about, uh, sort of give you a summary of one aspect of the research that uh, 
I and, and my group have been uh, doing in the last few years, which is on the thermodynamics of amyloid fibril formation, which I hope to convince you that this is sort of a neglected aspect of amyloid that is understudied and nevertheless plays an important role and should probably or deserves more attention. Um, all right, so a few words on the importance of amyloid thermodynamics, and then I will talk about various methods how to access the thermodynamic stability of amyloid fibrils based on equilibrium experiments, but also based on non-equilibrium experiments of growth and dissociation, showing that the information that can be gained is actually equivalent to those from equilibrium experiments. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the thermodynamic signatures of amyloid fibril growth, so the heat signatures, the enthalpic and uh, entropic signs. Uh, amyloid cold denaturation, an interesting phenomenon. And then finally, <clears throat> should actually be number five, a, a new method that we've developed recently, which is actually uh, more focused on liquid-liquid phase separation, but we've uh, also found that it can be used to monitor the conversion between re more easily reversible uh, droplet phases and less reversible amyloid fibrils. All right, so <clears throat> why study amyloid thermodynamics? Well. Um, Basically, um, <clears throat> there's two parameters, I guess, if we look at the sort of energy landscape of our protein aggregation, where we plot the free energy as a function of some kind of reaction coordinate, which is basically the, the approach of a monomer to a fibril, let's say, then there's two important parameters. One of them is the height of the energy barrier that defines the kinetics of the process. And the other important parameter is the thermodynamic stability. So once the monomer has sort of added onto the fibril, how difficult would it be to remove it? And now I'm thinking that, uh, you know, maybe 95% of the amyloid research in the last two decades has actually focused on the energy barriers, on the kinetics, and only very little on the stability. But I would argue that the, the importance of stability is much higher than 5%. Maybe we should rather look at it like sort of like 70-30, maybe, um, you know, 30% uh, importance of stability and 70 of kinetics. And why am I saying this? Because I think that the in vivo behavior of amyloid fibrils depends very strongly, or it's a hypothesis in a sense, depends very strongly on the thermodynamic stability. So we see that, for example, in Levy bodies, the amyloid fibrils are in plaques and tangles and so on. The, the, the fibrils seem to be quite persistent and difficult to remove, whereas in a functional uh, case of amyloid, which is a, a really very groundbreaking work by Roland Rieck, where who showed that some hormones are actually stored as amyloid fibrils. And in this case, they seem to be extremely easily reversible. So the, the stability and the reversibility really defines the biological behavior. And so that's why I think that we should be studying the stability also uh, on almost equal footing to the kinetics. And I've recently uh, sort of sat, sat down and summarized what we know about the thermodynamics of amyloid and, uh, and sort of written a little review that has just been published in Chemical Science. For those of you who want more detail, then uh, please go and check this out. So the first experiments that I'll show you are actually done with a model system, and probably many of you that have been in the amyloid field for a long time know this protein. It's not a disease-related protein. It's a very small folded SH3 domain, but it's actually quite important in the history of amyloid research because it's the protein that got Christopson involved in amyloid research, and many of the pioneering experimental and theoretical studies in amyloid field have actually first been performed with this protein. So just uh, to show quickly that at pH 2, where these, uh, this protein forms fibrils, it's actually strongly destabilized, almost not, nothing, no native structure, no native contacts left. It's a sort of disordered slash molten globule-like uh, state at which it forms the fibrils. So um, together with some of my uh, colleagues at my previous University of Düsseldorf uh, and Research Center Jülich, we were actually able to solve the the structure by cryo-EM, or they were rather than myself, uh, we pro just provided the samples of these fibrils. And actually what's really quite amazing about this is that uh, this is basically a fibril without polymorphism. So there is only one type of fibril in the sample. The only thing that you see is that sometimes you have a single filament or a double filament, <clears throat> but on an atomic level, there is no polymorphism. And also given that this is a totally you know, non-optimized, non-functional amyloid system, it's quite remarkable that basically 90% of the sequence incorporates into the amyloid core. So remarkably uniform and, and sort of eff effective uh, system that forms amyloid and quite a nice system to establish various methods. Now, uh, how can we measure the stability of fibrils? Well, first of all, we can uh, you know, image the fibrils, look at them, and we can sonicate them and make them shorter. And that will allow us to actually equilibrate them uh, faster so that we often use with uh, these 
sonicated uh, fibrils, also when we do kinetic experiments as seeds, but also in these thermodynamic experiments. And it turns out that by uh, monitoring the intrinsic fluorescence of the protein, we can follow the dissolution of the fibrils by a denaturant, in this case, urea, which is of course a common denaturant for protein folding studies as well. And when we plot, uh, for example, we, we use these spectroscopic signatures, we see, for example, in the fibrillar state, the tryptophan spectrum is almost completely suppressed and quenched, whereas in the monomeric state, there is a beautiful tryptophan spectrum. We can, of course, use this data to decompose uh, a given sample in the monomeric and fibrillar fraction, and we can plot the soluble fraction as a function of the urea concentration, and we get these nice sigmoidal curves that we can actually fit to various models. And we were the first, interestingly, to ever perform these kinds of experiments at different concentrations. And we found that the unfolding or denaturation curves actually depended on the concentration. And this is something that you obviously expect for an aggregation reaction, but that you wouldn't see if you did it for a folded monomeric protein. And this allowed us to actually develop a new theoretical framework because we found that we were not able to reproduce the concentration dependence with the current, currently used or, uh, or previously used uh, method that had been established by people like uh, Yuji Goto, but also some of the work by, by Chris Dobson, who used a very simple model with a single equilibrium constant. And we showed that in order to capture the concentration dependence, so both when we did the scan of the denaturant, but also in this case down here, we kept, we fixed the denaturant concentration at an intermediate value, four molar, and then we varied the protein concentration. And there we see that, for example, the previously available model, the isodesmic model with a single equilibrium constant for all monomer additions was just not able to reproduce it. All right, so the model that we are using now suggests that actually the first few monomers that add, uh, assemble together have a slightly less favorable equilibrium constant, and we would call that the formation of a nucleus. And then the subsequent monomers additions are more favorable. All right, well, uh, a few words on the choice of the denaturant in such experiments. It actually, you know, it sort of seems to be common wisdom that normally gonadinium, uh, hydro, uh, gonadinium chloride is a stronger denaturant than urea. And this is the case when we look at the unfolding of just the monomeric SH3 domain. So we need much less gonadinium to unfold it compared to urea. However, for the fibrils, it's actually the other way around. And that's something that's actually not commonly observed in the folding uh, field. And the reason why this is, is that um, electrostatic effects play a much more important role in amyloid formation than in protein folding because it's a homopolymeric aggregation reaction in which equally charged building blocks are added together. And therefore, in this case, the gonadinium chloride is actually acting as a stabilizing agent at low concentration and only at higher concentrations because of its nature as a salt, I should add, whereas urea is not a salt and therefore has no stabilizing effect. And therefore the effect of the denaturant is actually inverted. So this is a peculiarity of the amyloid uh, state. Now we wanted to look at the electrostatics in a bit more detail and we could do that because we used urea as a denaturant which itself does not screen the electrostatics. So we were able to do the stability measurements at different salt concentrations or different ionic strengths. And we found that indeed the fibrils became more stable as we added more salt. And now we were able to do something very interesting which is actually to compare this, the, the dependence of the free energy of the stability on the salt concentration which is shown here. And this is what's called the debye huckel plot where we plot actually the square root of the ionic strength against the logarithm of the equilibrium constant. And here, this is actually all the data that I did in my PhD, where we looked at the salt dependence of the kinetics of the barrier crossing. And it turns out that both of them have a very similar slope. So that means both the kinetics and the thermodynamics depend in a very similar way on the salt concentration, which in turn suggests that the electrostatic contributions of the transition, transition state versus the final state are actually somewhat similar, but as expected, the slope is a bit higher for the final state, meaning that electrostatics is a bit more important in the final state. So once the monomer is actually attached to the fibril, and that allows us to actually say something about how product-like the transition state of the fibril formation or fibril growth reaction is. The fact that the slope is very similar basically suggests that in the transition state, the monomer is already very in very close contact, very closely engaged to the fibril end. Now, um, we were also interested in, in seeing whether we could do similar experiments, but you know, using much less sample and using some uh, new technology, which is called uh, differential scanning fluorimetry, in which one can actually subject uh, very small volumes, five to 10 microliters of sample to different um, 
thermal scanning regimes. And we wanted to see whether by subjecting fibrils to this, whether we could actually extract thermodynamics as well. So we started with a fibril sample that we heated up to 110 degrees or so. And then we cooled it down again. And we found that on, upon cooling down, it behaved exactly like a monomer sample that had been heated and cooled down. So you can see that the fibrils are dissolving upon heating them, still SH3 fibrils in this case. And upon cooling, they, uh, there is high kinetic barriers for nucleation. So that basically the fibrils are not forming upon cooling down again. The protein remains monomeric. And then we started to use this uh, method to basically look at whether we could actually determine the on and off rate of the monomer ad, you know, adding onto the fibril end and dissociating of the fibril end from the fibril end. And we, we developed a way by, for example, subjecting fibrils to a complex um, scheme whereby we, we initially heated the fibrils for a while, which released some monomer. Then we subjected them to a rapid temperature jump to a lower temperature, and we monitored the growth, which is a sort of exponential relaxation to equilibrium. And by fitting that exponential decay, we were able to extract the elongation rate at, in this case, 40 degrees. And by doing this systematically at different final temperatures, we were able to do an Arrhenius analysis and basically found that uh, the the temperature dependence of the growth reaction could be very robustly extracted and agreed relatively closely to that determined from another method that we had also available, which is surface-based biosensing. Now, uh, one property that's more difficult to extract with other techniques is actually the dissociation rate. So what we did, we came up with an even more complex uh, scheme whereby we, we took fibrils, we heated them for a while, which uh, released some monomer, but which also basically made all the short fibrils uh, dissolve and then we went down in temperature again, let the fibrils grow for a while, and we had a very reproducible and very well-defined uh, point then. And then we heated it again. And at this point, we varied the upper temperature and we basically looked at the dissociation of the fibrils and fitted the initial slope. And all the, the theoretical analysis of all of that, you can find in the, in the paper. But the bottom line is that basically the fibrils, the relaxation towards equilibrium is actually also by the growth rate constant, but if one wants to extract the dissociation rate constant, one has to look at the initial slope. And by basically looking at the temperature dependence of the initial slope, we were able to extract the temperature dependence of the dissociation rate. And we find clearly that the dissociation has a much stronger temperature dependence than the growth rate, showing that, in fact, uh, as we heat the fibrils, the dissociation is initially negligible, but eventually becomes dominant. And we did that also uh, as a last experiment, we developed a, th a thermal ramping experiment where we said, what happens if we continuously just heat the fibrils? And here we will actually monitor the fluorescence uh, ratio of the fibrils at the same time as the dynamic light scattering. And we see as we heat the fibrils, they are starting to release monomer. But interestingly, as we reach the maximum temperature and then cool down again, the fibrils keep dissociating because they are lagging behind. They're not able to catch up with the speed of heating that we applied. And we can see with dynamic light scattering, the fibrils are actually starting to shrink as we heat, reach these high temperatures and then remain sort of stable for a while. And only once we reach lower temperatures, they're starting to, to grow again. And we see that they even reach larger sizes afterwards than before because all the short fibrils have dissolved and then all the longer ones grow and therefore we actually end up with a longer length distribution than at the beginning. And we were able to, to globally fit these kinds of scanning uh, experiments and actually extract from those global fits both the delta H of the uh, growth rate and of the dissociation rate. And from all of that, we can actually reconstruct a sort of energy landscape where we look at uh, this part, we see for example, if we look at the red plot, that's the free monomer concentration and equilibrium with fibrils. And as we heat from 10 degrees up to 70 degrees, we see this exponential uh, increase in the free monomer concentration. And we also see that the free energy is basically equivalent, of course, the free, en uh, the free energy stability and the monomer concentration, that the fibrils get destabilized. So initially at 10 degrees, they're extremely stable, almost 50 kilojoules per mole. And as we heat them to 70 degrees, they get much less stable and that translates into a very large free monomer concentration. And we can also basically do <clears throat> free energy landscape like that. And there we see, for example, that it's, this is, of course, at a given temperature of about 30 degrees uh, where we uh, plot this. So we see, interestingly, that uh, if you look at the free energy barrier, it's about 20 kilojoules per mole. And actually, the enthalpic barrier is higher than that, meaning that 
the barrier is actually entropically favorable. And this is partly because of the hydrophobic effect that when the monomer engages with the fibril end, there is a bit of uh, entropy of the solvent that is that's being gained. However, what's really strange then in a sense is that once we look at the stability, the stability is actually dominated by enthalpy. So that means the fibril stability at the end is sort of entropically slightly unfavorable, whereas the transition state is entropically favorable. So where is the entropy going? Well, there is always two effectors to the entropy. One of them is the hydrophobic effect, you know, the solvent entropy, and the other factor is the chain entropy of the protein. And we believe that perhaps uh, while the transition state is made partly entropically favorable uh, because it has, you know, there is an initial contact of hydrophobic uh, sequ uh, sequence areas between the monomer and the fibril end, which releases some solvent uh, into the bulk and therefore gains an entropy, whereas the actual ordering, structuring of the polypeptide backbone, which we then, of course, need in order to incorporate into the fibril, is associated with an entropic cost that more than compensates the favorable entropy of the solvent. All right, um, now uh, a few words on our studies of actually, you know, the heat signatures. Or, so, so what, is, what, what are the factors that define whether entropy, uh, entropy or enthalpy is the dominant factor in amyloid fibril growth? So of course, the technique of choice, if one wants the heat signature of such a reaction, is to do calorimetry. And that's what, what we did. And again, this is actually uh, experiments that have been pioneered by uh, Yuji Goto, who has actually been sort of our, our guiding, um, uh, you know, uh, person in, in, in these uh, physical chemical studies. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of his work because he, he started to study the physical chemistry of, uh, of these uh, processes, you know, sort of years before, before other people did. And so one of the ideas is that you can actually titrate monomer into fibrils and then look at the heat that's released every time when the fibrils are growing. And you can do this at different temperatures and basically determine the delta H, so the, the enthalpy of fibril growth at different temperatures and therefore the heat capacity of the fibril growth reaction as well. And what emerges from those experiments that is that in most cases, fibril growth is actually exothermic. So there is heat released. It's a negative peak when fibrils are growing it, with the one notable exception of alpha-synuclein whereby at lower temperatures, around about room temperature, it's actually an endothermic reaction. Uh, whereas if you start increasing the temperature, it will eventually become exothermic as well. So that's really interesting because it's a you know, process that changes time. Now we teamed up with a person called Sanne Abeln in uh, Amsterdam. She is an expert in coarse grain simulations to uh, reproduce key aspects of protein folding. And she also developed a model to uh, reproduce key aspects of protein aggregation. And she came up with this uh, coarse grain model, which actually where she can modify the contribution of the hydrophobic effect and check what, uh, you know, what consequences that has. And she found that at, at, uh, when she allowed stronger con contributions of the hydrophobic effect, then only at intermediate temperature. So how these experiments are done, you basically have a fibril that you fix with a few pe peptides and you only allow the peptides at the end to detach or attach as they please. And at, at intermediate temperatures, you see a stable fibril with you know, a large number of hydrogen bonds and, and uh, contacts. So you get a, a nice uh, free energy minimum. Whereas at really high temperatures, the fibril dissociates, so the monomer goes off and that's, you know, for entropic reasons. But interestingly enough, she also found that the state at low temperature was not actually as ordered as the, at intermediate temperatures. The, so the monomer had tendency of partly detaching and uh, sort of suggesting that for strong contributions of the hydrophobic or strong relative contributions of the hydrophobic effect, fibrils might even dissociate at low temperatures. And this is actually something that had been observed previously also by, <clears throat> uh, by I, th I think, um, the, 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 the Göttingen uh, crowd, uh, um, Griesinger and, and Zweckstetter, they have published some very interesting work in this. And also Gucci Goto again had, had reported that there was actually dissociation of amyloid fibrils only a very rare cases, but one of them was actually alpha-synuclein. When you cooled down the fibrils, they started to dissolve. So we looked at this in, uh, in more detail. In fact, just um, a few more uh, simulation data before I come back to the experiments. So um, Sane was actually able to adjust the strength of the hydrophobic effect, which is done by this parameter alpha. So alpha equals zero means no hydrophobic effect. And in this case, the actual, the, the enthalpy of fibril formation is flat, so there is no temperature dependence. And as she increased the strength of the hydrophobic effect, the delta CP, so the heat capacity became more and more important, uh, suggesting or meaning that 
the, the change in enthalpy as a function of temperature became more important. And, and what's interesting is actually only in those cases where the hydrophobic effect was very strong, she could see this sort of turning around of the free energy. And that means at low temperatures, the free energy sort of went above zero again, which suggests that the fibrils become unstable at low temperatures. So then we looked at alpha synuclein also. Uh, we wanted to see whether we could reproduce this and we used our chemical denaturation strategy and we showed actually that uh, we used here two different salt conditions. Uh, PB means uh, just phosphate buffer, no salt. PBS means with salt. And we found that both salt and higher temperature actually stabilized the fibril. So if we look, for example, at the blue curves, which is PBS with salt, as we cool them down from room temperature to four degrees, the fibrils clearly become less stable. And interestingly, as we actually go into a phosphate buffer without salt, we find that even at zero urea, so just in the, the, the fibrils and buffer, there is a significant fraction of monomeric protein um, suggesting that the fibrils are really unstable. So that means that if the fibrils are on their own, not very stable, and then one cools them down, then one can actually observe this phenomenon of cold dissociation. And it turns out the reason why we don't observe this for most other amyloid fibrils is that alpha synuclein amyloid fibrils are actually amongst the least stable amyloid fibrils of all fibrils. You know, if we take A beta or tau or all the others, alpha synuclein are actually really unstable. And only for those, we can get to a significant you know, destabilization by temperature that we actually see them dissociate. We also looked at uh, many different proteins also from the literature, and we looked at how in each case, the uh, enthalpy of fibril formation or fibril growth decreased, or, yeah, decreased with increasing temperature. We looked at the heat capacity in, this is in all cases, and we actually found that there was, was a very strong correlation between the, the, um, you know, the, the, the temperature dependence of the enthalpy, so the heat capacity, if you like, and the hydrophobic surface area. So this suggests that uh, the more hydrophobic surface area the more, the larger the delta CP. And this is actually something that has been proposed long ago for the protein folding phenomenon uh, as well. Now, in the last few minutes that I have, I want to switch gears a little bit and present to you new, a new method that we have developed and that I hope will actually be useful for all of the, those of you that uh, study the relationship between amyloid fibril formation and liquid liquid phase separation, which is of course now in everybody's um, you know, mouths and uh, test tubes uh, these days, uh, very, very, very actively being researched. So now what is this method? Okay, we're using a, a, co um, a commercially um, available uh, instrument called the FIDA-1, uh, which is actually a capillary-based experiment in which uh, a sample is pumped through a very long and thin capillary. And at the other end, we have a detector. And usually this is used for tailored dispersion studies to study the diffusion coefficient of proteins. And I'll show you a couple of data in a, in a couple of slides where we actually used it for that original purpose. But our idea was that if we are uh, having a liquid phase separated sample, so where we have liquid droplets inside the sample, every time a droplet comes to the detector, we would see a spike. And the reason why we are interested in this is that, of course, you all know probably that it has been reported that in many cases, liquid liquid phase separation can be a precursor of amyloid fibril formation. So inside these dense liquid droplets that under some conditions are formed by, you know, alpha synuclein, tau, but also FUS, TDP43. Basically, most of the amyloid proteins have also in the meantime been established to undergo liquid phase separation under some conditions. And often the liquid phase separation is a precursor of amyloid fibril formation. So in this case, we established some proof of principle experiments with a different protein called DDX4, which is actually not an amyloid protein. And we showed, for example, that, you know, we could uh, send different concentrations through and we would get a nice calibration curve. So we would be able to quantify the concentration of protein very accurately. Then we had a sample that phase separated and you know, we saw all these spikes and by zooming in, we could see that as we increase the PEC concentration, which increases the driving force of phase separation, the baseline successively dropped down. So we saw a decrease in free protein, in free monomer in the background. And at the same time, we also saw actually very strong, in this case is actually a function of calcium, which also promotes phase separation. We saw a very large increase in the number of droplets, in the size of droplets, and therefore in the sort of fraction, volume fraction of dense phase. Now, um, we studied, for example, 
the effect of DNA because it had been reported that DNA can very strongly influence the phase separation of this particular protein. So here we looked at the protein concentration in the light phase as we titrated in DNA. And we saw that you know, already five micromolar DNA basically dissolved almost completely the droplets. So very interesting. And this is at a concentration of almost 130 micromolar of the protein. Now, if we actually looked at first labeled DNA, we found that as we increase the DNA, Initially, the DNA gets sucked into the droplets, but then as we increase the DNA concentration, we see, of course, that the, the, you know, the droplets successively get dissolved and therefore the DNA gets released again. And so uh, what's interesting with this instrument, FIDA1, is not only can we do all these phase separation experiments, but we can also measure the affinity, for example, between the protein and the DNA in this case. And we found very interestingly that the KD of the single you know, particle, if you like, interaction between the DNA and the protein is about you know, 50 to 100 micromolar. And that's really interesting because at a concentration about an order of magnitude below the KD, we see that the DNA can dissolve the droplet. So that means if we know, for example, that a certain protein interacts with DNA at a relatively weak affinity, it doesn't mean that this, the DNA wouldn't be able to, to harm or to dissolve or you know, destroy the droplets at a much lower concentration because once the DNA gets into the droplet, it can interact with multiple mo uh, protein molecules at the same time. So this is basically a highly a multivalent interaction, a collective uh, phenomenon in a sense. All right, but now, uh, on the last uh, data slide, I would like to show you what uh, the link is actually between the thermodynamics of amyloid, which is the main subject of this talk, and this new technique. So we looked at alpha-synuclein liquid-liquid phase separation, and this is a work by uh, a postdoc which joined my lab at that uh, time, roughly when we were working on this new method uh, called Shumik uh, Ray, who came from Samir uh, Maji's lab, and who actually uh, was the person who discovered for the first time that alpha-synuclein can undergo liquid phase separation. So we said, well, let's look at, uh, let's look at that. And we saw well enough that, you know, if, we basically just have alpha synuclein but on its own uh, without any uh, inducer, in this case, no PEG. So we saw, we see a nice flat black line here, but then as we in, in, uh, induce phase separation by adding, uh, in this case, PEG, we see that the baseline drops down and we saw, see all these spikes appearing. Now, when we do this systematically over a longer time periods, uh, we see that as these droplets are starting to form, the baseline concentration actually drops down after about you know, 20 hours or so, or 16 hours. So suggesting that the droplets become more stable because they're in equilibrium with a lower free monomer concentration. And during, at, at this point, we still see, and that's an interesting feature of this instrument, we can also monitor THT fluorescence at the same time, thioflavin T. We see basically no thioflavin T fluorescence at this point. So these are still, uh, droplets that contain no fibrils, when you dissolve, uh, dilute them, they dissolve almost without trace. However, if we wait even longer, uh, and specifically after about two days, all of a sudden, the free monomer concentration drops dramatically down. So all, there's almost no monomer concentration left in the background. And at this point, also the THT fluorescence goes up uh, enormously, and we see basically lots of little spikes, which is probably fibrils and aggregates of fibrils that are coming through the, the, the detector. But also we see a high ba background fluorescence, which is basically probably just tons of small fibrils that are basically covering every, everything and are too small to be resolved as individual spikes. So we see that the drop in background monomer concentration is really, when, when there is a, an, a significant decrease in monomer concentration, then we see the THT fluorescence go up significantly as well. And this really, uh, our hypothesis is that we were seeing here is a sort of Ostwald's rule of stages, uh, you know, whereby the system reaches successively more thermodynamically stable states. And we can follow this both by the decrease in monomer concentration and by the emergence of thioflavin T fluorescence. All right, so to sum up, um, you know, contrary to what many people believe, I would claim the thermodynamic stability of amyloid fibrils is actually a well-defined parameter that can be determined for both equilibrium and non-equilibrium experiments. It's true that many fibrils are actually very stable, but that doesn't mean that one can't actually quantify their stability. And I would argue it's actually very important to understand, you know, in the context of why some fibrils can be dissolved by some uh, you know, chaperone systems or the proteasome and, and uh, God knows all these biological mechanisms that are able to actually attack some fibrils, but not others. I claim in order to understand that we have to really look at the stability. And so nano DSF is a promising method to study amyloid thermodynamics at high throughput and low sample consumption. 
The thermodynamic signature of amyloid fibril growth is dominated by the hydrophobic effect. So the, the, the large and negative delta CP comes from the hydrophobic effect, but only if the global stability is sufficiently low, then we can actually see cold dissociation of fibrils. So if the other you know, stabilizing hydrogen bonds and, and Van der Waals contacts and so on are too stable and the electrostatics is not unstable enough, then we will actually not by cooling them down sufficiently destabilize them to see a significant increase in monomer concentration. And finally, our capillary flow experiments, CapFlex, uh, we think is a promising method to study the driving forces for liquid-liquid phase separation uh, and you know, droplet size distributions, droplet growth kinetics, droplet maturation, degrees in reversibility, et cetera. So I think it's a very versatile uh, platform to study the conversion of uh, you know, reversible, very easily reversible droplets into less reversible amyloid films. And so there remains only to thank my, you know, collaborators past and present uh, in Düsseldorf, and I've seen actually many of the people that are named here in this list are actually present and, and listening, so a big greetings and big thank you for a great time I had in Düsseldorf for three and a half years goes, goes out to you, uh, folk. Um, my new, uh, my group members, some of them, those that were involved in the projects here, uh, Rasmus, Jakob, uh, Schumik, and uh, Assad, collaborators at KU, Celine, uh, Galvagnon, uh, and Daniel, her student, Wei Feng, with whom we collaborated uh, on some of the AFM, uh, colleagues at, um, or collaborators at FIDA Bio, actually Emil was a postdoc, and then he, he left and, and now works for the company that makes these instruments, and of course, Sane and, and Jurami for the simulations. Um, some of this work, the non-equilibrium work, is actually dedicated to Chris Dobson, who is, uh, of course, an, an amazing person, and all of you was, uh, all of you, I, I think, know him, and many of you had the you know, the chance to also personally interact with him. He had a, a huge impact on my own life and, and career. And, you know, I, I was extremely saddened when I, uh, when I learned about his, you know, totally untimely uh, death. And, and I would really, you know, like to dedicate much of this to, to, to his memory. And we also had a special issue of um, biophysical chemistry that um, Rams actually and, and Birgit Strodel invited me to, to, to edit. And I'm extremely grateful to, to get for this opportunity to express my eternal gratitude and admiration. Uh, for Chris. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. It's, uh, was, it's really great and very expire, inspiring. And um, there is a question from Rams, uh, who says that excellent talk. Do you think the um, endothermic uh, process of alpha-synuclein fibril uh, growth at a low temperature could be due to its uh, initial structure or the presence of oligomers? Um, okay, um, initial structure, good question. Uh, I don't know how much is known about whether it at low temperatures like 10 degrees or 20 or so, it is actually more structured than at you know slightly higher ones. Oligomers, I don't think so. We did quite a thorough characterization and I think at, in all of these experiments, we start from, you know, 99% monomer, uh, at least. So that, that I would exclude. Uh, however, whether the monomeric state is slightly uh, different, you know, that may well be. And, and of course, you know, alpha synuclein has this interesting structure of highly, you know, charge separated uh, N and C terminus, and th there may be some, some more, I mean, it's, I guess it's known that the disordered ensemble is, is sort of not totally unstructured and not not as expanded as a fully denatured state so there is there is contacts and interactions and perhaps those are stronger at lower temperatures so that, that, that is possible yes um I, I have actually a question about the functional amyloid which you have been mentioning uh, that it's easily assembles and disassembles uh, mm -hmm. while the the pathogenic amyloid is it's it, you alluded to that. So have you looked into the trendings of the sequences uh, to explain it from a thermodynamics point of view? Any insights into that? Uh, what, what, what is this tweak which makes it reversible? Hmm. So I guess in those cases where it is actually reversible, there is usually some kind of trigger. I mean, I, I think really that the work by Roland Rieck is, is, is really pioneering in the sense uh, these hormones, once they are uh, released into, uh, I, th I think, the bloodstream, you know, there may, there may be a slightly different pH. And also it's simply, of course, a dilution effect. So, but, but, but I think there is probably a sensitive, like a very high sensitivity on the exact solution conditions, pH and salt concentration and, and so on. And, and I'm sure that this is, is something that has been, of course, under evolution, evolutionary pressure for, you know, a long time. And therefore, 
uh, evolution has found a way of perhaps placing certain key residues uh, that lead to just enough charge repulsion to make it uh, you know, just enough uh, unstable. I, I think for, for ma many of these analyses, one would actually, the, 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 um, the sequence enough, I don't think is sufficient. I think we have to have the structure of the fibril in order to be able to say something about that. And I don't think these functional fibrils have been very uh, closely characterized. I mean, I know, I think I've uh, seen Antoine is, is here as well listening. Of course, he's, he's been looking at some functional amyloids, so maybe we should actually look at that. Um, but, you know, not all functional amyloid is reversible. Some bacterial amyloid in biofilms and so on is actually functional, but extremely difficult to reverse as well. So, you know, I think it's just that in all cases where it's functional, it's been under evolutionary pressure and probably it, it's, you know, it, it, somewhere in the details of the structure, it could be just one or two key residues that introduce just enough repulsion. But, but I, I have looked at that systematically, I have to say. Um, you know, I've lost track also how many structures of amyloid fibrils are available. Probably it's changing every day and maybe one, soon we'll have actually enough functional and disease related fibrils to, to perhaps actually do this kind of analysis. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. That's it's, uh, extremely interesting. Um, and um, my question is uh, about your um, uh, method uh, for studying um, droplet conversion and um, uh, to uh, into the, the viral. It's, it's such an inspiring uh, method. Uh, one thing which I was uh, trying to imagine, um, you, you're using cap uh, capillary flow. Uh, don't you worry that you're, and uh, the droplets are deformable. How, how mm -hmm. do you measure the size of it? What's... Um, um, that, that's a good question. It has been shown that shear can disrupt droplets and also, in fact, uh, in some cases, shear can even induce the aggregation of the protein inside droplets. And there's some really interesting work by Thomas Knowles and uh, Simon Alberti and so on. Uh, so we don't actually, uh, that the, the fact that the droplets might be deformed is not a problem because the field of view that we're looking at is much larger than the average droplet size. So if it's changing shape, we wouldn't see that even, we wouldn't be sensitive to that. Now, if it's actually broken up into smaller droplets, that would of course have an influence. So what we have done so far is we have looked at the reported viscosities and surface tensions of these droplets, and we have calculated the shear forces that act for the flow rates that we are actually performing and so on. And we have concluded that, that these effects are negligible for our kind of you know, region of parameter space that we are. However, I don't think that this is completely always the case. So it, it could well be that if you're subjecting them to even higher shear rates in smaller capillaries and so on, that you could actually break up the droplets. Um, and if it, you have an aggregation prone protein, it may well be that the shearing actually aligns the proteins inside the droplet. I think this has been actually shown that it's possible. And then you accelerate the transition into the um, aggregates. But, but in these cases where these people where people have seen this it's been under a quite mo much more extreme shear regime you know uh, the, the shear forces are actually not that extreme in our uh, experiments so we've, we've we've done these estimations and we believe that we're safe in this case and uh, and i have a follow up question on the um, on alpha synuclein uh, you you show that it's alpha synuclein uh, fibrils are really dependent on the self concentration and with a lower temperature uh, that they are more or less uh, like the, the stability changes like uh, with with the presence of the cell. Um, and, and then uh, in your studies of the liquid phase separation, it was again with alpha synuclein, but you use mm. uh, PAG. Ha have you tried, I, I might have missed it, but ha have you tried to see the temperature de dependence of uh, Pack-induced uh, synuclein fibrils, uh, whether these called um, or not? Actually, so, so th we have some unpublished data on this, and this is actually one of the rather more confusing pieces of data I have seen in this uh, space. So alpha synuclein droplets, when you dilute them, they are virtually instantaneously reversible. They just dissolve and disappear, right? However, when you subject them to a large temperature variation, for example, you put them to 50, 60, or even higher uh, degrees, they are eventually dissolving, but extremely slowly, or it takes hours to, for them to dissolve. And this is really strange because in all the other phase separating systems we've looked at so far, when they are 
when you heat them up, they usually dissolve virtually instantaneously as well. So th there is something interesting going on about the kinetics of the droplet dissolution. And also it seems like the, the droplet formation has a relatively flat temperature dependence compared to many other proteins. For example, the DDX4 is very, has a very clear cloud point. And if you go above that, they just dissolve virtually instantaneously. I mean, there's almost no hysteresis and so on. So something is interesting about the alpha-synuclein temperature dependence of droplet formation. Now, this is all done in the presence of PEG and we don't know uh, really, I mean, so people have seen alpha-synuclein phase separation as well without PEG, but there you need to go to slightly lower pH, pH five. And then uh, only then you see the phase separation without the PEG. So in all these experiments we've done, it's pH seven, but in order to see phase separation, we had to go to very high concentrations, you know, 200 micromolar synuclein or something like that, and quite a bit of PEG. So these are, you know, admittedly somewhat artificial uh, conditions, uh, but actually, uh, I guess uh, it's actually not that uncommon. <laughs> Many people actually use, uh, use the PEG. And, I think we have to work on the understanding better what the effect of the PEG really is, if it's just crowding or if, you know, is it just an effective concentration or is there some interaction going on that could perhaps also influence the whole thing. Um, but yeah, so, so there is there's much that data that we have in this space that we haven't published yet and we'll, we'll hopefully do soon. And I, I, this is my last question. I'm going to start like, like uh, asking the people. Uh, so I just want to remind the audience to raise their hands if you want to uh, join um, the panel. So you can ask your questions yourself and you can still uh, I'll, like post your questions on, on the Q&A. Um, uh, my, uh, my question is, um, again, for your system for st studying the liquid to solid transition, um, uh, have you tried it uh, for the complex mixtures? You, you've, you've shown that the DNA has quite a bit mm -hmm. of an effect on, on it, but is there any, any caveat which we need to be aware for complex when would like, because like face it, liquid phase separation, it's, it's a complex mixture. So ha have you tested yeah. it with like mixtures with the DNA and your main protein and how, how um, is, is it possible? I mean, it's just. Yeah, well, uh, I think you're raising a very important point there. Actually, I mean, for a start, uh, I mean, ad admittedly, most of the phase separation experiments that we are doing there, and I probably this is probably valid for many of the other people working on this currently, are of course you know far removed from physical physiological relevance because we just look at one protein in isolation. Now, if you look at biological condensates, membraneless organelles, and so on, they're not pure. They're they're full of things. They they sequester other molecules, right? They're just basically dominated by one type of protein, but there's many other things in there: DNA, RNA, and so on. Uh, so we have just started to look a little bit into that by, for example, looking at the effects of core phase separation with different mutants of a protein and try and quantify, you know, how much do we get perfect mixing or do we get demixing? You know, do, does one mutant form its own droplets and the other one its separate ones or do they just completely mix? I think this is gonna be a long way to really understand this. How does the, the condensate droplets of one kind recruit other molecules, you know, be it DNA, be it other proteins, be it sequence variants of the same protein, be it a totally different protein. But I, I know that, you know, other people are also working on this, how, for example, enzymes are being recruited into droplets and how their, um, you know, activity changes and so on. So sure, you know, uh, I think in, in order to really understand the biological condensate formation, we have to look at these kinds of complex, more complex uh, systems. But of course, they are not easy to study. You would have to put different fluorophores onto different molecules and then quantify them one by one separately, how much of this one goes in, how much of that one goes in. We've only just started that. And I think the data I showed on the DNA, where in one case we had the DNA labeled, in the other case, the protein labeled. And then we looked at the relative enrichment of the both molecules in the droplets. I think that's the sort of first step towards what you're suggesting. Thank you so much. That was really great. I, I don't want to steal <laughs> uh, your uh, like uh, the attention anymore. Uh, again, uh, to the audience, please raise your hands or post your questions. And uh, if uh, anybody in the panel has uh, questions to the speakers, um, you just uh, please uh, and just take your turn. 
Uh, I have a question Alex, uh, regarding the alpha C nuclein, which is a very um, challenging, uh, I would say, the amyloid, um, particularly when dealing with oligomers, because you mentioned that there is a problem with the stability of the alpha C nuclein. So, uh, and why do you think it is relatively less stable, uh, even febrile, than the other amyloids? Um, yeah, good question. I mean, you know, that's the, first of all, the numbers say that. So we, we measured the stability of many different fibrils and we found that alpha nuclein were the least stable. Now, why? That's a good question. Uh, so, you know, we have this very large C-terminal tail, which is highly negatively charged. And, you know, we also know that when we cut that off, we actually get a much more aggressively aggregating protein. So the C-terminal truncated variants aggregate super fast. I have to admit, we haven't yet measured the stability of the C-terminal truncated, but from all we've seen and, and know, and you know, monomer concentrations and equilibrium so on, I would guess that it's probably, they're probably more stable. So I think in the case of alpha synuclein, the C-terminal tail has a strongly destabilizing effect. Um, you know, because overall the protein has actually more negative charges than positive charges, even though the C-terminal, N-terminus is highly positively charged, but the net, C terminal is even more negatively charged. And, and let, at the end of the day, you're trying to squeeze many overall negatively charged molecules in a very tight space, which is the fibril. And I think that's just electrostatically highly unfavorable. And, and, and part of the favorable, you know, beta sheet uh, energy and hydrophobic effect, energy free energy is just, you know, eliminated or annihilated, so to speak, or, or compensated by the unfavorable electrostatics. You know, hence the strongly stabilizing effect of the salt. And probably if we add one molar of salt, we would make them even more stable. And perhaps eventually they would become very, very stable because the electrostatics would be completely screened out. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the oligomers, it's even less stable than the oligomers, let's say in amylo other amyloids like IFPP or uh, amyloid beta, yeah. which is probably also the c terminus is, is, is the Yeah, issue. I think that Daniel Otzen has done some really nice work on the stability of, of, of alphanuclein oligomers, you know, also chemically denaturing them and comparing the denaturation midpoints and so on. And he showed that different mutants had different stabilities. So yeah, they're, they're probably even less stable in the fibrils. Thanks. Alexander, a great talk. Um, do you think in addition to the C-terminal uh, playing a role in the stability of alpha synuclein fibers, um, aren't there water channels found in these fiber structures that could they play a role? Uh, good question. I mean, I don't know what, what, what kind of, you know, I mean, people find water in various places inside the fibrils, right? Uh, it actually has been, there was even Perutz claimed, you know, the poly Q or whatever fibrils, there were water-filled nanotubes or something, um, uh, like whatever, 15 years ago or something. Um, uh, so I don't know if that would actually be destabilizing or stabilizing, right? I, I think this is probably not so trivial to say. And I guess overall releasing water into the bulk is, is favorable and tropically, but I don't think that water that's trapped in a structure is always necessarily a problem. So. Uh, actually, uh, I don't know if, you know, there's now so many alpha synuclein fibril structures available. I mean, they're like growing by the day almost, right? There's whatever, 10, 15, I lost uh, count, uh, how many different polymorphs. And then you add the mutants and there's even more. And, and I, I, I don't know what, if they contain water in specific uh, ways or all of them or some of them. I mean, a systematic comparison of their stabilities and then looking at the structures, that's really something that should be done. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that in the, in the near future to make you know, fibrils under different conditions, all these different polymorphs for where the structures are known and compare their stabilities under comparable conditions. And then hopefully get a bit of a grip on what structural features of the fibril make it stable versus less stable. Yeah, so, so I think this, there's lots of work to be done. Yeah. Can you go to your slide on your uh, heating and cooling curves on one of your protein the, where the monomers are appearing when you cool down? Uh, Go this further one. back, maybe. Yeah, here, yeah, right here, yeah. the left mode. Mm -hmm. So, could you explain that? Well, what happens exactly when you cool this? The there's a linear. Uh, right. So, okay. So, basically, you see that if we have monomer, just mm -hmm. the, the the two blue lines are basically just we start with pure monomer. Yep. We we heat it up very fast and we cool it down very fast. 
the barrier for nucleation is so high that actually in this time scale, no fibrils are forming. Okay. Or actually when they are forming in some intermediate temperature, maybe they'll just you know, dissolve again, but probably the smoothness of the curve means basically no fibrils are forming. The monomer stays monomeric as we heat and as we cool down, it, it follows exactly the same trace of fluorescence. So it basically means you know, monomer stays monomer all the way. Now, what's interesting is once we start with fibrils and we actually heat that, you see that they are dis they're dissociating at about 80 degrees, 85 degrees. And then they, their spectroscopic signature becomes identical to that of monomer. So we see that the fibrils completely dissolve to monomer. And then as we cool them down, they behave like as if they always had been monomer, basically. So I, I admittedly, many systems would not behave like that. That's a bit of a, you know, a model system, which is just almost too beautiful to be true, right? You dissolve the fibrils, there's no trace of fibrils left. You cool them down. The barrier for nucleation is so high that you don't get any fibrils forming as you cool down. So fibrils quantitatively becoming monomer, you cool down, they stay monomer. And you know, many of the experiments here are probably more difficult to do with these messy systems, you know, a beta alpha synuclein and so on. But, you know, admittedly, this is like uh, the, the most beautiful fibril system uh, that, that there is actually. And our friends who did the cryo EM, Gunnar Schröder and so on, they just couldn't believe how nicely they looked under the AFM and said, you know, we can solve you that structure in no time at all. Of course, it took a bit longer, but they did a, you know, it had an easy time. So I'm not saying that all fibrils would be behave like that. There's polymorphism in the others and so on. And then your ITC traces, they don't go to equilibrium. How do you... Um, uh, like, yeah, well, so... I mean, we always get the complaint from the reviewers that these are in a messy, right? It, it, they are supposed to be messy. <laughs> uh, well, it's true. I mean, you know, they're not the, 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 the most beautiful curves and I should have maybe waited a bit longer, for example, here. But actually the, the beauty of this is that if eventually, for example, like it, let's say in this case, you're reaching the baseline again, you can just take the, the total integral of this and divide it by the total amount of protein you've injected and you get the molar heat. So you don't actually need to worry about each individual injection so much. But of course, you know, as I, as I progressed in this, uh, this was actually super old data from my PhD. Uh, eventually, you know, I learned that I should wait for a bit longer and let the system, you know, re-equilibrate. And then I had individual uh, injections, which were more reliable to analyze. But yeah, admittedly, um, perhaps not, not the prettiest data ever, but actually well, something that's notable as well, if you see that, it, you know, it takes like 10, 20 minutes in some cases for the system to reach equilibrium. And this really shows that this is fibril growth we're seeing there, right? So it, it just it takes a long time for the fibrils to absorb all the monomer that you've injected there because it just happens to grow from the ends. Thank you. And actually you can see that also the, you know, the kinetics changes as you change the temperature, not only the, the magnitude of the enthalpy, but also the kinetics. So that's, that's actually uh, reflecting the barriers as well as the stability. Shai, I have a couple of questions for you. Shai, are you there? I'm, the, I'm here, yeah, listening quietly. Okay. Well, maybe I'll stop my sharing. So in your cyclic peptide, you seem to have a, aromatic ring and um, five member and six member rings, if I remember correctly, or is it six member? Order? Six yeah. member. Okay. So do you think there will be a pi pi interaction between um, intermolecular pi pi interaction can stabilize uh, the whatever, uh, oligomer or inhibiting aggregation and so on and so forth. Can you comment on that? So basically what you telling is correct. Uh, you know, if you're adding more uh, aromatic interactions, mm -hmm. you can increase the pi pi stacking of the cyclic peptides and these peptides aggregate much faster. Yep. We show that also that the, the, the anti-amylogenic activity is, the, is really related to the potency of the cyclic peptide to self-assemble. Meaning that if you're increasing the hydrophobicity or the aromatic interactions, you can get in better cyclic peptides. But once you do that, you have problems with solubility of the cyclic peptides. So you have to somehow to go with some kind of uh, uh, solubility and not solubility, because if you want to inject the animals, you have to be sure that your samples are maximum uh, solubilized. So you need to balance the solubility versus the aggregated 
species, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you think so, when you inject to the animal, they, do they go as monomers or do they go as oligomers or do they go as... Oh, so this is a one million dollar question. So if, if you, for example, N-methylated the cyclic peptides, yeah. so in this case, they can only generate dimers, not more than that. You see that the activity is going down. Um, so I believe that the, you know, the, the activity of cyclic peptides is somehow related to their aggregation form. But telling you that this is the aggregated form that is active, I'm not sure because it's done, it doesn't make sense to me too much that the, the cyclic peptides are in aggregated form when they're reacting with the, a beta or alpha synuclein or other. So I believe that they are in equilibrium between the self-assembled and the monomeric form. And I, my belief is that this is a monomeric form that is ideally interact with the, with the a beta or with the uh, other uh, amyloids there. So still, it's not clear to me. Let's say in, in, forget about in vivo, uh, taking test tube. Uh, if you take a monomeric cyclic peptide, is it is it uh, active at all, inhibiting A beta aggregation? Does it interact with the monomeric A beta, or does it interact with oligomeric A beta, or fibro? Can you, or <clears throat> yeah, can you say something? So, so it, it's very that? difficult to you know, it's very difficult to know what is the situation of a cyclic peptide when you're working with it. For example, we show that we're going to solubilize and lower the concentration to make sure that you're monomers. Uh, so in, in this case, we have done some, such an experiment, for example, for THD or for uh, DLS, for example. In DLS, you can see that very easily because you know that if you have some aggregates or you don't. And in this case, in all of these cases, we can see very nice activity. So it's mean. Uh, this is my belief that the compounds are active in the, uh, you know, in, in their monomeric form. Uh, however, I think the aggregated form of these cyclic peptides, they they behave some such as like as a battery. It, it has been shown also for other hormones that they are in the let's say functional amyloids. That when they are releasing the monomers, they start to to make their activity. This is very, I think this is very similar to the, what we see in the hormones that there Bye, are. Alex, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, thanks uh, to you guys, it was great. Uh, shall I continue? So this is my belief. Uh, we, we are very happy to know the answer. Is it really the monomeric form of these cyclic peptides that are active or the aggregated form? Uh, I have to admit that uh, we inject the material interplanetarily, you know. So if if I believe that if they are also aggregated, then in some point they have to be dissolved in order to go to the bloodstream. Uh, so the aggregated cyclic peptide, do they, are they selective only to the beta sheet structured oligomers, or they 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 are, they can sense anything, any species containing aromatic rings? Uh, no, there are quite, you know, we, we're doing this experiment with lots of BSA, and BSA is not interfering with the activity. Otherwise, we can say that, you know, this peptide is interacting with any proteins. The, the interaction with the amyloids that they are rich in cross beta shake, uh, it, it's very high. We can see that. And for mean, example, so that, means, that means your oligomers in vivo condition are, are all cross beta structured? They are not cross beta sheet per se, otherwise they have to be in oligomeric form, but they can increasingly interact with the cross beta sheet. This is what is important. Since there are DL, DL, and you know, the, 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 the amide bound is perpendicular to the, to the, to the, uh, um, to the face of the cyclic peptides, so they can only generate cross beta sheet. They cannot generate a parallel or anti parallel beta sheet. So this is what I mean. Uh, what I, I believe that this is why they are so sensitive to to a structure that they can generate cross beta sheet structure. They stabilizing the cross beta sheet structures. So what is the driving force for your cyclic peptides to cross BBB? Do they cross the monomers, oligomers, or? Fiber. So you can so you can ask the same question: What is the driving force that these cyclic peptides are penetrating through the membrane? Yeah. So we show that for alpha synuclein, for example, 
that this cyclic peptide can very freely go through the membrane without making any damage to these cells. So my belief is, and it has been shown also by Reza Gadiri, that many of these cyclic peptides can go through the cetropinocytosis, uh, and then they can be released to the cytoplasm of the cells. And so one of the mechanism of action of penetrating to the cells is uh, penetrocytosis. And you can find them also in the lysosome. We show that the cyclic peptide, you can uh, nicely see them in, that they are accumulating the lysosome and then um, they are uh, you know, released into the cytoplasm. And by the fact, you can see that, for example, in neuronal cells that there are over, uh, over uh, expression of alpha C nuclein, you can see that the alpha C nuclein and the cyclic peptide both are co accumulated in the, in the lysosomes, for example. Hmm. So didn't you say that these uh, cyclic peptides are antimicrobial in the beginning? Yeah, so for example, even with our cyclic peptide, that is uh, what you, uh, you know, give the, your comments, you can see some uh, background antimicrobial activity. So, so you can see that in are a beta, for example. For, yeah. So if that is the case, you have a lot of uh, bacteria all around when you inject these molecules. Why can't they be busy in attacking bacteria? How come they ended up uh, in a way? Uh, it's a good question. I, I, I think as I, I, suggest, I, I, I mentioned it before, the affinity of these cyclic peptides for cross beta is much, much higher than so uh, you know, they, they, interacting they, with the membrane. So that means that are they poor antimicrobial compounds then? They are poor, they are not very active. Uh, definitely, that they are not in, let's say, in the submicromolar range. However, if you, for example, you're increasing the, this has been shown already with the Reza in several nature papers, that if you increase the cationic residues, you can get very, very nice antibacterial and antiviral activity just by interacting with the membrane of the bacteria. Okay, there are some questions in the chat box. Um, uh, can you test the idea with a fluorescence probe attached to an amino acid? Is it to you, Shai? I don't know. Which question, please? From can you test? It says uh, from Esteban, can you test uh, that ID with the fluorescence probe attached to an amino acid to look into dynamic of the transport? Yeah, so th this is a good question. So. Uh, you mean about the self-assembly of this cyclic part, if I'm not wrong. So, for example, you can definitely see if you uh, introducing a fluorescent probe to this uh, cyclic peptide, when they are aggregated and you're losing the fluorescent, they are a quenching effect. Okay? It's very, very strong quenching effect. So you can definitely see that, that, uh, that the cyclic peptide self-assembled uh, under different conditions. So this is the one of the our bigger fights is to find uh, formulas to to solubilize these cyclic peptides. So and I it, 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 indeed, I can say also that when you taking this uh, aggregated form of uh, fluorescently labeled the CP two, for example, and you expose it to the amyloids, you can see that, that the fluorescence is going up, which is suggesting that. This is the monomeric form of these cyclic peptides that are active. This is a, also a question for Rams. Uh, I didn't have, uh, I didn't think thought about that, but this is actually what this is what's happening. So the fluorescence uh, is going up when you have a floor, uh, when you're interacting with the with the beta or with alpha C nucleus. I mean the results are great, but I'm I'm not able to understand um, at the molecular level. It's very confusing because. You said that it's very sensitive to the cross beta structure. Does that mean that your all your um, molecules which are entering the body going to be should be busy in clearing the plaques, right? Which which are rich in beta sheet structured fibers as opposed to oligomers. Uh, you mean about the specificity of these cyclic peptides? Yeah, yeah. So 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 this is what the results that we have till now. So we, we check that, you know, we have no one compound uh, which just get a patent for that, that there are actually sub stoichiometrical concentrations. So it's meaning that they are not just, you know, floating in the body or floating in the blood. 
they're doing something that they are active in sub uh, stoichiometry concentrations. And this is a low, low, very low micromolar, let's say nanomolar range that they are active after injection. Say. I have a more complicated question even. I mean, now we're dealing with polymorphism. So we know that, uh, let's say, beta oligomers are very polymorphic, particularly, let's say, if we, we're dealing with oligomers, which are the toxic species, and this is very important. So if you using your cyclic peptides, can you distinguish whether your cyclic peptides um, are good inhibitors for polymorphic oligomers? No. Because in the both cases, you have the cross beta sheet structures. Even in either form of the polymorphism, you have the same cross beta sheet structure. Yeah, but, but you not treat this in the case that you have the early stage? Meaning the that- The question is how much early in, uh, the polymorphism is generated. Is the polymorphism is generated after the, for the hexamer, hexamers, for example, so our cyclic peptides are not working with the hexamer. We know that they are working the range of monomer, dimer, and trimers. So the question is either you have polymorphism in such early event of aggregation, which is a dimer and trimer. I'm not sure, but you know, this is a question that should be you know, asked from people that are a structural biologists to see how early the polymorphism is happening. So I, it's still um, very puzzling here. You showed the data that for 10 micromolar a beta, you need 100 micromolar of uh, the cyclic peptide to, mm -hmm. to have a 70% inhibition. Yeah, this is, this is CP2. This is the first generation. So the, for the first generation- so let, me, let me complete that. That is not an efficient inhibition at all. You're right. To start with. I agree with you. So, so that means you need tons of peptide, right? 100 micromoles is a lot. And you know, that's a very high concentration and cyclic peptide can also mm -hmm. aggregate and, and destroy the membrane too. Yeah, I have a good answer for you. So so the that answer that we are doing yes, we are, the toxicity as well. Yeah, the to toxicity assay, we have done it tons of experiments with a chronic injury, uh, daily injections of cyclic peptides to the animal, to the normal animals. For example, we injected the 10 milligram per kilogram daily to the, to the normal mice for about one month. And then we did a battery of uh, blood and you know, tissue examination to see if there's any toxicity and we didn't see any toxicity. And we injected in this case, IV, not IP. It usually IP, you have a lower toxicity than IV. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that, that you know, these cyclic peptides, uh, you know, you have to take to the, uh, to the concentration that the concentration of these amyloids in the brain are not very so high. There are problem in the picomolar concentration. So the THT experiment that we are doing and you see five-fold higher concentration is requ uh, requested, we are limited to the output of the THT. And this is the reason why we have to increase the concentration of the a beta to 10 or 20 micromolar, which is not realistic in vivo. The concentration of a beta is not reaching to this concentration. And in the second uh, uh, you know, aspect of that, I, I told you we have already uh, cyclic peptides that are much, much more uh, uh, selective and, and uh, effective. Uh, basically, most of the our in vivo experiment for efficacy now is going with the second family, which there are uh, active uh, substoichiometric in vitro. How much is the concentration? So, if we using, for example, ten micromolar of a beta at the 0.1 micromolar, you have total uh, disaggregation and inhibition, which is uh, which is uh, amazing. So to, to, to disaggregate or to inhibit 10 micromolar A beta, how much of the latest version of cyclic peptide needed? 0.1 micromolar. 0.1 micromolar. Does it aggregate at 0.1 micromolar? It's not aggregating. At 0.1 monomeric. micromolar, the cyclic peptide is monomeric. Monomeric. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's very exciting. So when Thanks. you inject all these molecules in the in vivo condition, these are all D and L amino acids. So 
they're not going to degrade just like that. So how we, how does how do they get uh, cleared? Okay, so uh, so we, we checked for full uh, bioavailability and uh, uh, you know pharmacokinetics. Yep. Uh, so we have some processing the liver. The liver can oxidize that it's, uh, with the cyclic peptide, but most of it is exerted during the urine. They are washing out from with the kidney out outside. So you can see the bladder with the PET CT. It's it's glowing all the time. So for all those molecules that enter the brain, they accomplish the task. And what will happen to those molecules? So so I, I first of all the the you know accumulation of these cyclic peptides. We can see that after twenty hours, we don't have any any let's say rest of the molecule is not there. They are getting out. They are washing out from the brain. Remember that if one compound can cross the BBB, they can also cross outside the BBB. Sure. Yeah. So, so basically, they are washing out from the brain. Yeah, and you can, we show that also with the fluorescent molecule that they have the CP2. After the cer a certain time, uh, in a normal animal, at least, you can see that they are washing out. In AD animals, you can see that they are staying in the brain because they have a beta that they are binding to it. And mm -hmm. once they are binding to the a beta, they cannot cross uh, the BBB outside because they are now bounded to the, you know, to the fibers or to the oligomers. Great, great results. Thanks. Congratulations. Thanks but puzzling though, still a lot more data to come out. This yeah. is the reason why we need more collaboration for, you know, for the, to understand in molecular level what's going on. You know, even with the NMR, which we did with the collaboration with Astrid, uh, there are some questions that we cannot answer. You know, it's uh, probably we have to go to solid state and then to see how the interaction is happening there. With the membranes, for example, or with the, with the, specifically with other oligomers or fibril, uh, different fibrils, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Shai. Okay. Thank you very much for your time and for thank you. Um, thank you, stuff. everyone. Thank you, Rams, for organizing. Thank Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Magda. It was nice to see you again. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. And thank you for all the attendees that are still here. <laughs> bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye, guys. Okay. Bye bye.